So thanks everybody for joining us at the virtual Mark Twain Library. Good to have you with us on this cold January evening. And it's also wonderful to be dreaming of gardening in the warm summer sun. So there's no time like the present to begin planning that perfect garden. To help us with those plans, I am delighted to welcome tonight's speakers from Homefront Farmers. Well, Homefront Farmers is an organic home gardening company right here in Reading. And joining us are Allison Villa and Miranda Gould. So welcome, we appreciate you being here. Um, but before I do hand it to you, I'm sorry, I, I forgot my, I just wanted to let everybody know because this is a webinar, everybody is muted tonight, but we do wanna hear from you throughout the program. So please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A function. And that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you'll be able to type your questions to us and Miranda and Allison will answer them at the end of the program. We also are recording tonight's program, so you can let your friends and neighbors know who couldn't make it, that it'll be on our YouTube channel. And that'll probably be in about a week that you'll find it there. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the evening over to Allison and Miranda. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine, for your introduction. Um, welcome everybody. I'm sad that I can't all see all of your wonderful faces, um, but I'm glad you're here. My name is Allison. I am a homestead manager with Homefront Farmers. I started in August, but I do have a background in gardening. Um, my background is mainly in uh, nonprofit management and specifically in planning and managing school gardens. And I'm going to be giving the main presentation today. And I also have Miranda here with me. Uh, I'm Miranda Gould. I um have been with Homefront since the very beginning. It'll be almost a decade this summer. Um, we started out, you know, only having a couple clients and, you know, now we have many more than that. So it's been fun to see everything grow literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, and I live in Monroe uh, with my husband and two mini me's. <laughs> Awesome. Well, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you and start the presentation. So give me one second to do that. Okay. All right. Um, first, I want to start off with an overview of the session. Um, in this first half of the presentation, we're going to, we're going to go over each step that we go through in planning our clients' gardens. And we're gonna kind of let you know how you can tap in and do it just like us. Um, the second half of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A function. Um, if you do have a question during the presentation that's immediately relevant to the content, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box. And Miranda will have her eye on that for the whole time. So we'll make sure that your question get answered. Um, if you have a more general question or a, like a question specific to your situation at home, we ask that you hold that until the end, until the discussion portion. One last thing before I move on, I just wanted to let you guys know that this presentation will be sent out in PDF format. Um, I've linked a lot of helpful resources throughout the presentation. So rest assured, you will be able to click on all of those and explore them after the session. Okay, so we're gonna start with step one, um, which is to assess your garden. So before you start planning your garden, um, you want to get out there and just assess the situation. So that would entail going out there and seeing if your garden is sunny or shady. Um, it's also good to determine the cardinal direction. Uh, south facing light is best. So, you know, you want to put all your crops that need lots of sun on the south side. If you haven't built your garden yet, then this is also really important information to take into account. Um, obviously full sun is best, but if you have limitations, you can always um, try to put things on the south facing side of your house again, because that provides the best kind of light. Um, 
Let's see. Great. So the next thing that you need to assess in your garden is soil. So we use a service for soil testing through UMass Extension. Um, they charge $22 for routine analysis and another $6 to assess uh, the percent organic matter. Um, I have a screenshot on the slide here just of what that, those soil test results look like. Um, the soil test, you might be looking at this and thinking, what the heck does all of this mean? Um, when you order the soil test, it comes with a list of very detailed recommendations and calculators for what to use and how much to put and all that good stuff. In addition to testing the content, the nutrients of your soil, you should also just take a look at the the level of your soil. If you have raised beds and they're looking a little low, of course you want to add a little bit more dirt before the new planting season. Same deal if your soil is looking, if the texture is off, if it's not draining well, you want to add to make it drain a little bit better. Lots to take into account here. All right, step two is the most fun part, in my opinion, is choose your crops. Uh, I think this time of year, we all love cozying up with our seed catalog and dreaming about what we want to grow. Um, you just make sure that you use what you learned in step one, assessing your garden, to inform what you can and can't grow. So for example, if you have a shady garden, you might not be able to grow things that require a lot of light, like peppers or tomatoes. Um, don't forget about your successions. Uh, so make sure if you have anything like, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we'll talk about successions later as well. But if you have anything that goes in the garden late or is harvested early, see if there are things that you can plant um, before or after, like um, radishes, spinach, arugula, those sorts of things. All right, step three, mapping out your garden. This is the step that takes up the most of our time as homestead managers at Home from Farmers. Uh, we use a really awesome program called Grow Veg. Um, there's a screenshot of it here on the right. It's affordable, it's awesome, and it allows for all kinds of customization. Um, so before you grow into, before you go into Grow Veg, you're gonna wanna measure your garden or if you have raised beds uh, to just to know the dimensions of your garden um, and make sure that you, when you get in the program, you draw it out accurately. This is really important for plant spacing and determining how many plants you'll need to buy. Also make sure that you rotate families each year. I've included a list that you can access later of the common crops that people grow and what families that they fall into. So if you didn't already know, oh, Miranda, I see your mouth moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just wanted to say that one of the great things about Grow Veg is that you can make a follow on plan from year to year. So if you draw out your garden this year and then next season you make a follow on plan from that plan, um, it will help you with the crop rotation a lot because it'll grow red where that plant family has been planted before so that you can easily see when you're putting together ne the next plan, like where to put things, where, where the ideal spot is to put things. So I think for the average gardener who is not uh, totally up to date on their plant families, it, it helps you a lot. Definitely. And I am going to, after this slide, I'm gonna share my grow veg screen with you guys and just show you this kind of how to make a follow on plan and some of the other most helpful tools of grow veg. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say before I move on is uh, the reason that we rotate families is to avoid pests and diseases. So most pests and diseases are specific to certain crops and um, those pathogens can overwinter in the soil. So if you plant the same thing again, then they can get extra diseased. So we just wanna make sure we're changing it up from year to year. 
On that note, I am going to show you a little bit of grow veg. I wish we had time for a tutorial, but we do not. So I'll just show you some of the most helpful and important features. And they do have a lot of basic tutorials on their website as well as like other gardening resources, so. Yes. So here is a, this is actually the 2021 garden plan for one of my clients. Uh, you can see here that it's all mapped out very neatly and nicely. They've got some very lovely little graphics. And one of the great things about grow veg is that you can add your own varieties and spacing. You know, when you see the asterisk here, it's because we've added our own preferred varieties. So the feature that Miranda was talking about in terms of uh, making a follow-on plan, I've already made one for this client, so I'm just gonna show you how it works. If you go up here in the top left-hand corner, there's a new plan button. And when you click on that, you can turn this little switch on that says create follow-on plan. And you can choose all these different Features, like Miranda was saying, you can, you can choose to carry over uh, all your structures, uh, any layout or irrigation graphics that you have. Um, and we also like to, this button here, you can carry over all the perennials so that they show up on your new design. I'm not gonna click create plan for this one because I already have one. Um, the other really important feature that I wanna show you guys is the plant list. So once again, up here in the top left corner, you see plant list here, which I'm gonna click on. And it gives you a list of all the plants that you have in your plan. And right here you have the count. For, for each one, for how many plants you will have. So this will help immensely in determining how much seed and transplants that you need to purchase. And Grow Veg has their own default spacing, which is generally, you know, great to use. We kind of tweak it for our own spacing, um, but, and you could too. So if you like to plant something more densely, you can go into the, the plant detail and and change that for yourself. And you can also change um, all of the like planting seeding dates on there if that matters to you. Great. All right. Let's keep going. Step four is to order your seeds. I have put a list of companies that Homefront Farmers purchases from primarily. And once again, you'll be able to access those after the presentation. Or of course, you can feel free to just jot them down right now. I would say it's late January. If you're gonna buy seed, you should order ASAP because as the spring approaches, they will start to sell out of things. So if there's something that you really want, make sure you get it. <laughs> you'll also need to determine what you'll grow from seed versus transplant, which might just depend on um, what's available in your local garden stores. Um, we have a great question here from sure. Kathleen Joyce. She said, how stale do seeds go from year to year? I have packets left from spring of 2021. That is a great question. Um, so different seeds vary in the amount of time that they go bad. Um, it really depends on the variety of seed and where you're storing them. But let's assume that you're storing them in, in a cool, dry place, um, not in the wet, not in the heat, that kind of thing. Um, Generally, you can keep seeds for, I would say, two to three years. After that, it starts to go downhill pretty fast. 
some seeds like tomatoes tend to last a little bit longer and some, some seeds like onions, um, you should really buy a new seed every year because the germination isn't that great on it. But if you're wondering whether the seed that you have is doing well or not, you can always do a little paper towel test. Um, so you can just pour out a small amount of that seed onto a paper towel, get it wet, little moist, put it in a Ziploc bag and just keep it on the counter in the sun and see if things germinate. <laughs> it's gonna take a couple weeks, especially with in, indirect sun in the, in the house, but you can test your seed that way if you'd like. Thanks, Kathleen, great question. Moving on to step five which is to add soil compost and fertilizer. So just a little caveat here that um, the best time to do these kinds of soil additions is in the fall. That's when we try to do ours, um, but you know, it's January now. So if you haven't done it yet, that's okay. Um, like I said, you should add more garden soil to raised beds that are looking low. Um, we add at least a, uh, cubic quarter inch of compost to most of our gardens each year, depending on their needs, um, just to keep the organic matter levels up. And same, same deal with this stuff. Um, it might be a good idea to purchase early because as we get closer and closer to the month of March, April, um, your local garden centers will start to sell out and you wanna be on top of it. I'm sure you're all really excited. And step six is our last step, which is to follow through, follow through with your plan. Um, the most important thing is to have fun and enjoy the process. The nice thing about having a personal garden as opposed to doing a client's garden like I do, is that your personal garden can be your own experiment. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's okay if things fail. Um, you can always just make a note of it for next year and try again. So don't, don't sweat it. Um, on that note, I want to just stress the importance of record keeping. Just make sure to make lots of notes throughout the season uh, about what worked, what didn't work, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, some other things that you should definitely record. Uh, if you make a last minute change to your plan, if you plant something that wasn't originally on your plan or you plant something in a different spot, that's important information to have for next year in terms of crop rotation, et cetera. It's good to know when things have bloomed or fruited um, so that that can inform your succession planting. Take photos, take lots of photos. Um, again, it can just be a good way to remember what was going on and how things are looking at different points throughout the year. Um, maybe make note of any pests and diseases that you had issues with uh, so that it stays fresh in your mind when you're planning for the following year, etc. cetera. Awesome. Um Sorry. Someone has a question about watering methods. Uh, ah, we, yes. We didn't really touch on that too much because I guess we're talking about planning, but we can talk about planning irrigation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, I. So the question is, can you talk about watering methods, bird sealing, sealing hose versus sprinklers versus hand? Okay. We highly, highly recommend installing a drip system in your garden that is attached to a timer. So it'll go off every day when you set it to go off um, and you don't have to think twice about it. This is hands down way, way better than sprinklers. Please don't put sprinklers on your vegetable garden. Um, that's just going to propagate lots of mildew issues and disease issues that you don't want especially with crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, squash. Um, you want to get the leaves wet as little as possible. Um, you know, hand watering is fine, but there's so much to do in a garden. <laughs> and to remember and or just even have the time to water it every day or twice a day when it's really hot out in the middle, middle of the summer um, 
you know, for some people it's therapeutic and for others it's not realistic. So you have to decide what kind of person you are. Um, but I know that I have my garden on a drip system, even though I sometimes hand water in addition to that. And, um, you know, if you like to go on vacation in the summer at all, I would recommend it. <laughs> okay. Great. Sorry. Another really good and important question. <laughs> All right, before I move on to the Q&A portion, I just really wanted to briefly go through um, what you can do if you're interested in our services. Um, so if you're interested in garden maintenance, you can visit our website to request more information. And I sound like a broken record, but these links will be available to you after the session, so don't worry. Um, our website is homefrontfarmers.com though, if you wanna get on there. Um, in addition to garden maintenance, we offer beekeeping, maple sugaring, mushrooms, and more. Um, speaking of maple sugaring, we are still accepting maple clients. So if you're interested, I have provided the link to get in touch. And lastly, um, I wanted to share that we are having our maple sugar festival on Saturday, March 19th. Admission is free. And there will be uh, live demos going on and fun activities that are kid friendly. So uh, admission, admission is free. So if you can make it, we'd love to see you there. Just don't forget to RSVP at the email provided on the right at the bottom of the screen. And we will all be there. We'll be happy to meet you. So there are a couple um, residual questions that we can get into here. And I'd say like now is a great time if you have any gardening related questions that we haven't touched upon. Um, I know they're almost limitless questions. So we can, you know, even if it's not garden planning related, if it's just gardening related, we can, we're happy to answer those for you. Um, so someone asked about planting herbs. I'm not exactly sure what your question is in particular, but if you want to clarify exactly what your question is about herbs, um, that would be great. Uh, what about Mi miracle Grow and other add-on fertilizers? Okay, so um, we use only OMRI-listed fertilizers and pesticides and other gardening products. So OMRI-listed means it's meant for organic use. Um, so we don't use miracle Grow. We do use fertilizers. We use a mixture of um, soluble fertilizers that are basically come in liquid form. I like to think of it as the IV of the plant world. So it's, it's quick in and quick out of the plant system. And then we use some other granular fertilizers that are more like a, a food that will kind of, you know, stick on the bones of that plant, so to speak. So it'll last for a couple weeks. Um, and we do fertilize regularly. There are different fertilizers for different things. So you wanna use a higher nitrogen fertilizer when you're first transplanting and when you want a lot of foliar growth. And then you wanna use a low nitrogen, high phosphorus fertilizer after your plant is fully established and um, it's starting to produce flowers or fruit. So for fruiting crops or, or flowers, um, you wanna use something low nitrogen, high phosphorus after that plant has gotten established and is starting to flower. Um, and then, you know, you always want to make sure from your soil test um, that your soil has appropriate organic matter. And if it is low on organic matter, um, you want to add compost. We regularly will add just a sprinkling of compost on the top of the soil every year just to kind of refresh things. Um, but if your soil is really compact or just not super fertile, you may want to add as much as three inches of compost and incorporate that into your soil before you plant. Um, you can layer you can layer the compost on top if if it's just a very small amount like a sprinkling, but if it's much more than a quarter inch, you really want to incorporate it into the first couple inches of soil. Oh wow, we have a lot now. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Allison, do you have a time check? I know we're on a, okay. Yes, it's 7.56. Um, would you like, would you like me to read the questions to you? Uh, 
Yeah, sure. If we, if you spot some good ones, I think we have a nice half hour to. Yes, great. Um... Oh, here's a, uh, where do you get your compost or anywhere local you recommend? Um, so we get our compost a couple different places. Locally, we order wholesale in bulk. So I'm not sure, but if you want um, like bagged compost, we recommend Coast of Maine, uh, Vermont compost. Um, oh my gosh, there was another one that's pretty good. I think it's called Gardener's Gold or something like that. Yep. And you know, in a lot of vegetable gardens and raised beds, you can also find sometimes that things are getting too rich. So you don't want to go overboard. You only want to add it if you really need it. So that soil test is pretty important and the organic matter percentage is pretty important. You want it to be in the range of six to nine percent. If you're underneath six, then you're going to want to add like a nice three inches of compost. And um, if you're over that, then you probably don't need to add anything for a while. Great, we have a question. Oh, go ahead. Hi, we have a question about um, raised beds versus just ground earth. Any preferences or benefits? Yeah, I mean, so our company, we build raised beds um, for many reasons. One of the reasons is we live in New England. There are a lot of rocks. <laughs> so if you're going to dig, um, it can be a little difficult with raised beds, you're just kind of layering nice, rich soil on top of that. So you don't have to dig, which is pretty nice. Um, another thing is drainage. It's really good to increase drainage for most garden veggies. And so raised beds kind of make that really easy. Um, you know, virgin soil will have more natural biology in it right off the bat. So it's kind of, you know, you weigh your, weigh the pros and cons, but I love raised beds too, because they keep things neat and tidy. Whereas if you have an in-ground garden, you might have trouble controlling weeds in the pathways. You know, um, when you have that division there of the wood of the raised bed, then you can put down weed block and gravel in the pathways and it can be all neat and contained. Um, you're not fighting like the grass growing into the beds all the time. Great. Uh, what kind of insecticides, if any, do you use specifically for cucumbers and squash pests? Yeah, sure. So that's a hard one. <laughs> We, uh, we actually don't use any insecticidal sprays for cucurbit pests. Um, we have cucumber beetles, which you can basically monitor and um, try to go grow crops that are resistant to bacterial wilt. So the reason bacterial uh, cucumber beetles are, are an issue is because they spread bacterial wilt. So if you can grow some cucumber varieties that are resistant to the wilt, then you know you are going to have a better chance of that. Um, crop rotation helps, but when you have a smaller garden, that it doesn't really apply there to the pests because they, you know, if you had multiple fields to plant something, then that would work, but not in that case. Uh, then we have squash bugs, which you can scout early in the season and actually use duct tape to remove the eggs from the undersides of the leaves. That's the easiest and best way to prevent, prevent squash bugs is to get the eggs off. And the duct tape doesn't tear the leaf, it just gets the eggs off. It's super easy. Um, and squash borers are the bane of many gardeners' existence. Uh, we do squash borer surgery. I would say there's probably a 60% success rate with that surgery of getting the little maggots out of the stem, um, you know, catching it early. So really going out and monitoring like every other day, it's much easier. I mean, this goes for everything. It's much easier to catch something on the early side and control it at, you know, after a certain point, it's going to be too late. <laughs> 
So organic gardening is really all about prevention and um, yeah, there's no substitute for it. Let's see. I'm just looking through them too. Cucumber mosaic disease. Um, so for, for most, so that's a virus for most cucumber, for most diseases, you really want to do crop rotation, first of all, to try and uh, prevent from getting it in the first place. So, you know, th certain pathogens can winter over in the soil. So the wider rotation you have, the better. So, um, you know, if you, if it's going to take you three years to plant that cucumber back in the same spot, then you can control things a lot better. Um, the other thing is that there are a lot of cucumber mosaic virus re resistant varieties. Um, and you can see that when you go onto the seed catalogs, they will have codes for all of those diseases and resistances. So that's one reason why you might want to buy a hybrid that has a, a better disease resistant pack resistance package um, rather than going with an heirloom. Other good ones. Yeah, I'm just answer. I was just typing in an answer to one. Mm. Uh, we have a looks like we have a good one here. You mentioned crop rotation works best in a sizable garden. What? is a sizable garden in your opinion. I do move my plants around, but now I'm wondering if it's all been for naught. It's definitely not all for naught. Uh, we do crop rotations even on, in our smallest gardens, but it may not be as effective um, for pests in particular because, you know, when a lot of things can fly <laughs> and, and walk and run, you know, between the beds. Um, but I would say it's definitely still worth it. Even if you just have a two year crop rotation and you reverse it every year, like every little bit will help. Someone over here is saying, can you talk about garden plants or flowers that can keep deer away? Um, so I would say that no plant is actually going to actively keep deer away, <laughs> but some plants are less appetizing to them. Um, the first rule of deer resistant plants is that there aren't any, <laughs> but there are plants that they like less. So um, as far as what we grow goes, anything in the onion family, they usually don't go after. So onions, leeks, garlic, chives, things like that. Um, lots of things with a strong flavor. So cilantro, dill, fennel, uh, woody herbs, rosemary, thyme, sage, lavender, and marigolds. Those are some of their least favorites. And then a lot of flowers, zinnias, dahlias, usually they don't touch them, um, you know, most of the time, but never say never. <laughs> and somebody's asking about preventing weeds. Covering soil with landscape fabric often traps growing weeds, question mark. Yeah, so uh, weed control. I would say in most people's home gardens, you can control weeds in a couple ways. Um, you can use mulch, which is great. If you already have a problem area where you have really super invasive uh, weeds that have really deep roots, I would suggest tarping it with like a thick tarp for at least a couple of weeks in the hot heat of the summer. And you will just fry everything underneath it, but you have to leave it on. If you do it in the spring and cool weather, it will just make a lovely little greenhouse and it'll grow even more luscious. <laughs> so don't do that. Wait until that hot, dry heat and you can squelch like a problem area really easily that way. Um, Another tool that you can get um, on Johnny's or many other places is called a hula ho. Other people call it a wire weeder. They basically do the same thing. And if you have like a blanket of weeds that's only a couple inches tall, um, you're basically scraping just underneath the surface of the soil to um, not only kill those weeds, but you're also killing the weeds that were germinating um, kind of right behind it. So that's definitely one of the most useful tools that you can 
ever have. And in the spring on a, on a sunny day where the soil is like a little bit dry, just going around and doing that over your whole garden is gonna help you really keep the weeds suppressed. Um, but you can't do that if you have mulch down already. So it's kind of like a, you gotta pick, pick your poison or <laughs> your tool. And we have some really great ones coming in here. Um, Jennifer Shire asks, is there a good spring veggie to start with? Someone told me to try spinach. I mean, spinach is a great spring veggie to grow. It enjoys that cool weather. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the easiest of everything in the spring to grow. So if you're looking for something really easy to start with, I would go with peas. You can plant them directly into the ground from seed and um, they fix their own nitrogen. So even if your soil is like not super rich, they usually do really well. All you need to do is give them a little trellis to climb and they'll be very happy. Okay, the Wegeners are asking, can you talk about how to assess actual sun sunlight? It's often subjective. Yeah, so, okay. Um, there are many a sun app that you can actually download for free on the app store that will, you can uh, kind of angle your phone around, like stand in the spot where your garden is, angle your phone around um, the, the sky like 360 and it will tell you exactly how many hours of sunlight you get throughout the season. Um, but I would say, you know, if you are standing in the garden and you face south, in general, you want as few obstructions in front of you as possible. If you have a very tall tree on the south side of your garden, it's probably not gonna grow that great. Um, <laughs> it's gonna provide a lot of shade. Um, you know, shade on the east or west side is going to give you either afternoon or morning shade. So, you know, that is definitely more workable. I would say if you're going to have a tall tree line anywhere, you want it on the north side because it's going to cause the least amount of shade. So even if you don't have an app, you can just, you know, look around and sometimes you can do a little bit of tree trimming and that makes a huge difference. Otherwise, other times you have like whole line of trees <laughs> there's like just woods right there and um it's hard to fight so Miranda we repeat the name of the tool you just recommended for weed control so there are a couple names of it um you can look for hula ho so h-u-l-a ho h-o-e um, and some people also will use a wire weeder, which is a very similar to tool. And you can buy all of that on Johnny's Select Seeds website. Um, we have that link for you. They have several sizes and lengths of, um, they have like a short handled one and a long handled one and all that. All right, Reed asks, any tips for seedlings? Mine always start off gangbusters and then fail when I transplant. Interesting. Um, yeah, so it's hard to say right off the bat without seeing you actually do the transplanting. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, it could be a couple things. You want to make sure that when you're putting your transplants outside, that you're being pretty conservative with timing. If it's too cold, um, they're not going to like it. So you want to make sure that you're waiting and being patient. <laughs> um, generally speaking, we like to put cool weather crops out starting in April, uh, beginning to mid-April, depending on, you know, when the last hard freeze is. And we put warm weather crops out after the last frost, usually mid to late May, sometimes as late as early June, depending on the weather. I don't know if you guys remember this past year over Memorial Day, it was super cold and wet <laughs> and like everything that everyone had just planted was just hating life. <laughs> so um, don't be shy about waiting. You can also harden off your transplants. So like 
put them outside for, you know, the day and then bring them in, back in at night for a couple times. And that can kind of thicken their skin, so to speak. Um, you also want to make sure that when you're transplanting, some things really don't like to have their roots jiggled up. So you want to make sure that you're just being careful and, and not stressing the plants out too much. They're already going to, you know, go into somewhat of a transplant shock just because they're in this new place and cooler temperatures and it's like a shake up for them. Um, so try not to mess with the roots that much if you're some things like it more than others, but I'd say err on the side of not messing with those if you can. Um, and then you also want to use fertilizers when you transplant. We like to use both a granular fertilizer and a soluble fertilizer at transplanting um, just to really mitigate transplant shock as much as possible and baby those plants um, until they latch on. Uh, Chris asks, I read it is not good to rototill a garden. Your thoughts? <laughs> so it really depends what the state of your garden is in. Um, in general, you know, there's a huge push towards going no-till, um, doing no-till farming. Um, when you do till the soil or turn the soil, you break up a lot of the homes and the bio biology that's there. So certainly if you're not starting out, a, a lot of people think, um, oh, I have to turn my garden every spring or every fall, I need to turn the soil. That is wrong. And it's only going to produce a more compact soil. The more you turn it, the more compact it gets and you're killing some of the biology there. So what you can do is, you know, if you don't need to add much compost and your soil is pretty decent and dark and rich already, you don't need to do anything. Um, if your soil is super compact and a lighter color and it seems like it needs a lot of help, then you know you may want to turn, whether it's with a tiller or a shovel, you may want to turn some compost into their beds. And we just use shovels. We do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> We don't use a tiller except for like on the farm with huge, huge um, spaces. So. Great. Sandy C. Merton asks, have you tried using companion plants to discourage pests? If so, have you found it to be effective? And if so, what are your most favorite companion plants? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, well, my favorite companion plant is just planting basil next to tomatoes because they go together when you eat them. So they should go together when you plant them. Um, but in all seriousness, I think the most important part to remember about companion planting is that it really doesn't do much to plant things together unless the thing that is the flowering item um, is actually flowering. So um, the whole idea behind companion planting is like keeping the pests away and all that. And in order for that to happen, you need to have that thing flowering and attracting beneficial insects to your garden. Um, and it probably doesn't really matter whether it's right next to, you know, whatever crop you're trying to keep the pests away from, or if it's, you know, five feet away. <laughs> Um, it's all kind of good in the hood. Like you can, you can mix and match. Um, I think height is really important for companion planting. You know, you don't want to shade one thing with the other. So that's why, you know, if you have tomatoes, they're growing really tall vertically, and then you can put the basil in front of them on the south side um, to kind of catch that sunlight. So, um, I just really like putting a lot of flowers in the garden, in the vegetable garden in general to help attract beneficial insects and keep bad bugs away. Um, so, you know, my favorite, I, I'd say my favorite flower to grow in the vegetable garden is a zinnia. 
because they just it's a gift that keeps on giving they attract so many butterflies and native bees bumblebees all that kind of thing um and you know other insects that will help keep the bad bugs away one of my favorite examples is with the tomato hornworm or really any caterpillar that you find you can even find them on cabbage loopers sometimes is um there's a parasitic wasp that lays its eggs inside the caterpillar and you'll see these tiny little white eggs on the top of the caterpillar um, when you see those you know that you don't have to do anything to kill that kid caterpillar it's already dead <laughs> um, and you know the wasp goes lays its eggs on on its back and it's it's parasitic, so it kills it. Um, and they're pretty gnarly. Uh, Patty Sechi asks, do you use trap crops for insect issues? Uh, yeah, that is a huge debate on whether it helps or hinders. <laughs> Generally, like what people call a trap crop will be something that attracts a pest more. So the idea is that it attracts it away from some of your other crops. Um, there's a lot of debate over whether it helps or it just attracts more of that pest to your garden or farm. So I would not rely on it <laughs> personally. We don't use them. Mm -hmm. We had another question from the Wegners. They've asked, how deep do you want to work your beds? Uh, for most vegetable gardens, you know, 10 inches to a foot is plenty. You really don't need much more than that. Um, as, as deep as you can fit your spade shovel in and not kill yourself, you know. <laughs> Uh, really, the only things that need super deep, I mean, tomatoes like deep, we like to bury the stems very deep so that they have a nice deep root system. Carrots, obviously, like a nice tilth and a, a pretty deep soil. Um, and parsnips, really, parsnips and sweet potatoes grow deeper than anything I've ever seen before. If you are like a huge fan of those and you want to grow them, I would maybe I would dig it out at least a foot, possibly a little beyond. Um, but even if you don't do that, they're gonna penetrate deeper than that just on their own and it'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> you don't have to go crazy. Miranda, I think you clicked the button for this question. Uh, M. Oh. Brown asks, go ahead. <laughs> do you recommend, yes, yeah, sorry. That was a mistake on my part, but I will answer the question for sure. Great. <laughs> uh, do you recommend sweet peat for vegetable gardens? Yeah, you can definitely do sweet peat. Um, I would just go easy on it. You don't have to go very heavy on it. And I would make sure that when you, you're you using it as mulch and not as compost. So you're gonna put it around the plant after you plant it, but you don't want that mulch that is not broken down yet to get into the root zone of the plant because it can easily rob nitrogen from, from the plant. If you get lots of chunky plant matter, including mulch and sweet peat is a mulch. It's a fine mulch, but it's still mulch. Um, so you wanna try to avoid that and just you know sprinkle it on the top. You don't need much, maybe like half an inch or an inch, yeah. Uh, horse poop as an addition to soil. Uh, I would say, you know, I am not an expert in, in manure, so please, you know, take my answer with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, I'd say anytime you are dealing with an animal byproduct, it should be composted very, very well for your own safety. The only animal manure I've heard of people using directly is actually rabbit manure. Um, but even that, I would do a little bit of research. <laughs> Usually involves like waiting a couple years <laughs> or processing it in a high heat to kill pathogens. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, what do you think of straw for mulch in veggie gardens? Yeah, we've used it before. It, it can be great. Um, you know, after a while, the color fades and it can kind of look a little bit less nice. Um, we've had issues with weed seeds in there and, you know, you're like planting a bunch of grass in your garden. <laughs> so just like keep an eye out for that, but it's, it's certainly not a bad choice, especially over garlic or something if you're planting it in the fall. Uh, tips on planting sweet potatoes. Uh, so you can order sweet potato slips from Johnny's and lots of other places online. Uh, they like it warm, 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 and as long a season as possible. So probably ideally you wanna plant them end of May, early June leave them in the ground as long as possible until the first frost. You want to harvest them before the first frost, but you gotta keep your eyes peeled because mice and voles and squirrels, chipmunks like to go in there and eat the tubers. Um, especially when it, the weather starts to cool, they get this like instinct to like eat all the food and burrow. Um, so you want to keep your eyes open for like little tunnels in there. And if you see that, dig them up immediately because they're eating them. <laughs> but they just are a warm weather crop and they need as long a season as possible. So, but you really shouldn't have to do much with them at all. Salt hay. Uh, I know nothing about salt hay, so I'm sorry I can't answer your question. <laughs> Don't know what it is. I'll be honest. Me neither. Um, yeah. I have worms for vermiculture. Should I use more or less of the castings when planting? Should I put the castings? Oh, I lost the end of it. Sorry, that's my fault. It's okay. Let's see. Yeah, I scroll down. I'll find it for you. Uh, worm castings are awesome to put on your garden, you can put that in the root zone because it's all broken down. Um, so that's great. You don't even have to use it as a mulch. You can put it right, mix it right into the soil, kind of similar to a compost. Well. And then last one. Okay, don't click this one. I won't. <laughs> I have a pretty large number of beds to water, but I find that hand watering keeps me connected on a daily basis and on top of anything I need to know, like insect attacks. I also use rainwater as much as possible in my greenhouses so that they get all that good stuff from the rain. If you use a drip system, what do you recommend as a practice to remain vigilant? Sure. So it sounds like we have a hand watering person here and you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I would say if you do hand water to try and water the soil, not the leaves. Um, you can inadvertently spread pathogens also if you have your nozzle touching all of the plants all the time and moving around. So if you have like mildew in one place, it'll kind of spread that over. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you like it, that's great. I would say to be vigilant, just walk out in your garden, look under a lot of leaves, um, a lot of eggs are are laid on the undersides of leaves. So if you feel like you're not seeing anything, I'd recommend looking on the undersides of leaves. I'd recommend going out at twilight. Um, that's when a lot of slugs and caterpillars kind of come out more, usually in like the middle of the day, blasting sun, a lot more things will be hiding for you. Um, cutworms, that kind of thing will come out more at night. Um, yeah, I mean, just walk out into your garden. You can do, I mean, there's so much to do in a garden. You can be pruning, you can be thinning, you can be harvesting and also looking for pests. So usually like when I'm harvesting kale, I'm also picking caterpillars off <laughs> constantly. Um, we do have some organic sprays to control that, but um, if you don't want to spray for any particular reason, hand picking is, is the best thing. Tomato blight. Um, it depends what kind of blight you are talking about. <laughs> um, and we have about five minutes left. So uh, just a time check. So 
Tomato blight is a colloquial term. There are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of tomato diseases. Um, again, I will just say that organic gardening is more about prevention than slapping a Band-Aid on something because we don't have a whole lot of Band-Aids at our disposal. So what you can do, a couple things. Um, with tomatoes in particular, they really, really need weekly pruning to keep an open plant habit so that when it rains, um, plants can dry out fast, your fruit can ripen more readily, um, and really for the health of the plant, it should be pruned very, very often. Um, so that's one of the first things that you can do to prevent blight is, is accurately pruning your tomato. The other thing is by putting it in full sun. Sun is going to combat mildew the most out of anything. So, you know, when you're pruning, you're just making it so that more sunlight can get down onto those leaves. Um, and then, you know, if you would like to use some sp organic sprays, you can use um, Bt and also potassium bicarbonate um, in a rotation and as a preventative measure against mildew. And you can basically use that on any vegetable crop um, as a preventative measure for any disease or, or mildew. With the potassium bicarbonate um, brand name that we use is called Green Cure. You can actually see it erase downy mildew on squash and things like that. Um, it does not totally eradicate it, but it, it can help. But I would say if, if you're gonna choose to do one or the other, pruning and allowing more sunlight down onto the plant is much more important than spraying will ever be. Allison and Miranda, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. I just am amazed at everything we've covered tonight. I think there will be some incredible gardens in Reading this summer. So <laughs> we want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Elaine. And thanks everybody for coming. Yes, thank you. For, it's good to have everybody with us tonight. So be well and happy gardening. <laughs> happy dreaming, everybody. <laughs> good night.